Greetings and salutations fellow book readers. This is Mark and the book I will review today is The Elephanta Suite. Before we continue, this is personalized limited edition of the Elephanta Suite with leather cover designed and made by me. At the end of the video, I will tell you a couple of ways of how you can get one for yourself if you are interested. Now let's get back to the review. The Elephanta Suite is a 2007 short fiction collection by an American writer, Paul Thoreau. Thoreau is best known for his travel writings, but I also enjoy his novels and short stories, many of which are based on his voyages and living in a variety of exotic places. A few of his novels have been adapted into films, the most famous being The Mosquito Coast, starring Harrison Ford, but the one I like the most is Chinese Bugs with Jeremy Irons, based on the novel Kowloon Tong, which takes place in Hong Kong on the eve of its handover to China. I also enjoy Thoreau's travel books, which are written in a nicely flowing prose and read a bit like a novel. There is this personal emotional depth which allows the reader to connect with the narration and what I specifically like is that Thoreau is the integral part of the retailing and the story somewhat revolves around him. Not just being an outside observer relaying facts, at which he is also very good and perceptive. Thoreau's writings remind me a bit of the great English writers Somerset Maugham, V.S. Pritchett and Graham Greene, but with more drama and less humor. Well, he is a typical post-war middle-class American liberal who finished college, joined the Peace Corps and went out to save the world, mostly from the people like himself, and probably always voted Democrat. All that to the side, I consider Thoreau one of the better American writers of the last 50 years, but there isn't much competition. What is the Elephanta Suite about? The book is a collection of three fictional stories which have India as a common element. It is a view of India from the outside and the impact India has on a foreign visitor. And additionally, it is a portrait of a modern day ugly American roaming the world. The book also alludes to the under the surface but ever present love and hate relationship between tourists and locals as each one tries to get as much benefit for themselves as possible from their interaction with each other. A bit of the plot. The book is divided into three seemingly unrelated stories, but connected by the place, India, and subtle crossing paths of the main characters. The first story, titled Monkey Hill, features a middle-aged, well-off American couple Odie and Beth Blunden staying in a luxury resort, where, unfettered by being far away from home, each one individually is able to scrutinize their life and even try to remedy some regrets and suppress desires and emotions. The second story, titled The Gateway of India, focuses on a middle-aged, divorced American businessman, Dwight Hansinger, who seems to be searching for a new life or a new beginning and, somewhat incidentally, finds himself in Mumbai and as the result of his stay there, he learns much more about himself than about India, possibly more than he wanted to know. The third story is titled The Elephant of God and is about a young American woman, Alice, traveling through India in a search of some kind of spiritual enlightenment. She ends up in Hyderabad, where she has a life-changing experience, but it is not what she expected when she decided to go to India. And that's the basic summary of the three stories. What are my thoughts about the Elephanta Suite? I like the theme of the book, Travel Through India, and the personal self-discovery it produces, and I also like the style it is written in, it is a novel, but it also seems a little of a travel book, which is not a surprise considering who the author is. The novel dissects three different types of travelers 
that might find themselves in India and how they might react to it. They all are Americans, maybe because the writer is American and feels more comfortable in predicting behavior of his own countrymen, but the individuals could be any Western wealthy nationality. Well, to be fair, Europeans are more aware of the world outside their bubble and it makes them a bit less ignorant. Also, the setting is India, because Turo seems to have spent more time there and knows it better than other places, but I think it could be one of many other exotic countries. I spent a decade in Brazil and can relate to a lot of what Turo is writing, especially the gateway to India. I think the large part of Turo's writing are based on personal experiences just because of the psychological and emotional depth of the protagonists. Well, perhaps not so much the elephant a god, where the main character is a young woman, and Turo's insight there might be more superficial and based on other observations. The protagonists of the first story, the wealthy American couple, are your typical luxury travelers that visit slums to satisfy their curiosity and probably to have a story to tell their other wealthy friends at their boring country club dinners. Their trip is nothing more than a superficial getaway, in some ways similar to a trip to the zoo, to look at exhibits through the safety glass, where one can occasionally get scratched or bitten when spurred by the need to feel better about himself, he sticks his fat fingers through the iron bars to hand over some scraps to the animals. Or in the case of the Blondens, the money to the needy locals. Their act is a bit like a foreign aid on a small scale, it does more for the giver than the receiver. They are sympathetic, but can never be empathetic, and compared to the other two, they are the most distant and most removed from the reality of India and least impacted by it. The reason for it is that there are two of them and they form their own bubble. And that's why traveling with other people will always minimize your experience. Plus the short amount of time they spend there makes them not travelers, but just casual tourists. Then there is Dwight Hansinger, the anti-hero of the second tale, who experiences India on a much more profound level because of the length of time he spends there and the reasons behind it. India was a foreign country where he was assigned not to enjoy but to endure. His India seems an earthly purgatory where he is sent to clean himself emotionally and even spiritually. He came to a crossroads. He could get up and leave and everything would continue the same or stay and later not be able to go back. Hansinger's benefit of being in India was not what he learned about India, but what he learned about himself. And in the end, India offered him some kind of personal victory over his past. I think sometimes it is better or easier to face one's own demons by going far away to a neutral territory where one's reflection is clearer. Besides trying to find himself, Hansinger also sees himself as a metaphoric 21st century Peace Corps volunteer or benefactor and his twisted reasoning for it is that he is indirectly helping the locals by directly improving his own life, especially financially. But as usual, in this kind of situation, he underestimates the locals. It reminds me of my own time in Brazil when the newcomers would arrive and say to me, with surprise and even a bit of disappointment, the people here are pretty intelligent. And I would think that perhaps they expected some type of colonial scene, ignorant natives bowing to their new masters. The third story focuses on the American girl in her early 20s. She is your typical millennial, well-educated, liberal feminist, who is highly opinionated, blunt and judgmental with a romanticized view of the world she hasn't seen. But the ugly reality appears once she arrives in India. From distance, India was splendid. Up close, it was horrendous. 
She is disappointed at real India since it doesn't reflect the India from the novels she read. Furthermore, she carries a lot of psychological baggage from her youth caused by being fat or ugly depending on the period of her life. And she resents her traveling companion for having it easy because she's pretty. She's somewhat antisocial and connects more with the elephant than the locals. She thinks the animal is her only friend, but perhaps he only cares about how many peanuts she gives him, just like the people around her. Further, her two Indian roommates in the ashram demonstrate through their ignorance that the rich Indians are as much out of touch with real India as the foreign tourists, which probably is the case with the wealthy in any country. She herself leads a double life, one spiritual in the ashram and the other more practical as an English teacher in the call center. And this duplicity seems to help her to maintain some form of psychological balance. Turo is a keen observer and injects a lot of what he learned during his own travels. I remember he wrote in one of his travel books when he found himself in the middle of human chaos in some large urban center somewhere in India. People think that our future is some kind of paradisical setting with flying cars and being surrounded by luxury. But I think this is our future, India, overcrowded, smelly and with plenty of poverty. As I mentioned before, tourists see India from a bubble, just like the rich Indians do, so I think the important part of this novel are the observations of the place and the people. The problem of India is that India is so divided, and to comment on poverty in India is to comment on nothing at all. Poverty is just one of many parts of India, and all of them create sharp contrast. There is poverty next to extreme wealth and widespread illiteracy sharing space with some of the most educated people on the planet. If one would risk to define India, which might be better left as undefined, it would be a collection of extremes. Further, when talking about the people, Turo writes, Doctor had an Indian habit of monologuing, which passed through everything, and didn't allow itself to be distracted by not allowing to be interrupted, and he was indifferent to what anybody else had to say. And the Indian couple asked some questions, but as usual didn't listen to the answers, instead they continued to talk about themselves. And this is so true about educated and better of Indians. Talking, which seems more like lecturing and not listening, perhaps not to hear any criticism, and often overselling their country since they feel it is underappreciated, and maybe because of it, they individually feel underappreciated. But this is common to any people who feel that their home has a lesser reputation than it deserves. There is some evident criticism of India, but Turo seems to be even harsher on America and make some keen observations about the so-called Western traveler or expat. Basically, there is plenty of under-the-surface snobbishness and presumptions made visible through patronizing statements. I think, in general, people like to travel to far away and poor countries in an effort to feel better about themselves and their lives, and in addition, for many middle-aged men, an increasing number of women, there is the hope of making their exotic sexual fantasies true. They travel to commit a carnal sin, and before returning home, they try to purify themselves, maybe by giving money to the locals or doing yoga. I think the Las Vegas slogan, whatever happens in Vegas stays in Vegas, defines modern traveler in general, and can be the unofficial title for the Elephanta Suite. Whatever happens in India stays in India. To me, most of today's leisure and business travel seems the continuation of the voyages started in the Age of Discovery and continued through colonial expeditions. All travel is motivated by curiosity of what is on the other side and hope to better one's life. It also is an escape 
you think from a place, but mostly from yourself. And the problem with travel to escape from yourself is that you take yourself with you. India, in a certain ways, serves as a mirror for the people who go there. It offers a reflection and makes visible what might not be so evident at home. There seems to be, under the superficial surface, a certain brutal and without shame honesty about India. Maybe because, at its core, India is not willing to pretend, since it takes too much valuable energy to do it. Thoreau also uses India to compare the human conditions throughout the world, such as in this statement. Poor mature faster and have fewer illusions about life. It refers to the idea that the poor living in proximity to the wealthy are very willing to sell and prostitute themselves. There is also the contrast between India's eternity and complexity and the temporality and transparency of the West, when the protagonist of the first story says, Everything has passed, especially in India, but anything I have done has no meaning. It is what it looks like, and I am what I appear to be, and India never is. I think the longevity of India is linked to its ability to adapt to the changing circumstances, but somehow, at the same time, it is able to keep its core identity. The passage reminds me, again, of my time in Brazil, when the newcomers would be swept off their feet by their initial experience there and tell me about their grand plans for their future there. And I would respond, careful, in Brazil nothing is what it seems and the first impressions are always wrong. The protagonist of the second story, when talking about his first impression of India, says, It was more dirty and more smelly than any other place I have been to. It was horror, and it never stopped, and Indians were praising it constantly. Based on my experience, I can say no place is as good or as bad as your initial impression of it. It will always become better or worse. Life is dynamic, and conditions and perceptions are always changing, and it applies to travel. And yes, the book offers a lot of generalizing and stereotyping, but I like generalizations since generally they keep us safe and alive. And besides, the stereotypes in the book seem to be there more as a provocation to engage the reader emotionally. Thoreau, through the writing, doesn't make it obvious whether he likes or dislikes India, but keeps it rather vague, even with all the emotion injected into the story. To sum it up, The Elephant as Sweet is a Westerner view of India and, at a larger part, a general view of what we now call the developing world. In my younger days, during the Cold War, it was simply referred to as a third world, with the first world being the wealthy Western nations and the second world the block of the communist countries in Eastern Europe. But now, there is no more second world, and when I sit in a sidewalk cafe and look around, I realize that we here in the West are pretty quickly becoming the third world. Anyway, the Western view of India, simplified by personal experiences and colored with prejudices and ignorance, but there are also some pretty accurate observations. We can say that India is unique, like no other country, and because of it, India is like any other country, singular in its experience, customs, and traditions. And for me, this idea of India being different but the same is what made the elephant a sweet and enjoyable read. Some people will find the book uh, dark and offensive, but that's life. I like Thoreau because he makes an effort to be honest about travel, contrary to the typical boring, everything is beautiful and everybody is happy, guy like travel books. Okay, let's talk about the physical book. The book I am holding is a paperback, which I transform into hardcover, leather-bound edition. 
To make the cover, I use grade A naturally tan hide I buy from a tanner in North Spain. It is the same leather Louis Vuitton uses to make his bags, so it is top quality. I do all the processing of the leather myself. First, I design the cover, which what I did here, I used this watercolor of Gate of India, since I thought it nicely represented the book subject. Uh, this is the bag with the blurb, and inside front cover, I, I, I printed a quote from, it, from the book. If you want to see a more detailed video where I explain how I transform paper bag into leather bound hardcover, click on the link in the description. I will make a maximum of 100 editions of each title. Each one will be numbered and initialed, and the numbers will go in chronological order from 2 up, since number 1 stays with me. The price will be around $100, so if you would like me to make one for you, you can click below on my email and send me a message. I do not guarantee I will do it, since it will depend on the time I have available, access to leather, and if I can get my hands on the copy of the book. Now, if you're not willing to spend the $100, but you still want the book, what you can do is click below on the PayPal link and donate $3 or more to my channel, and for every 100 donations, I will make a lottery and draw one name, and the winner will receive the book. So, if you are cheap but feel lucky, this might be the way to do it. Also, your donations give me the extra motivation to make the book reviews, and I appreciate them very much, so thank you in advance. One more thing, when you make your donation, remember to include the title of the book you would like to win. The book itself is beautiful. Visually, it has a very nice texture, it smells great, and the more you handle it, the more beautiful it will become. And it makes a great gift for yourself or somebody who appreciates books. So, if you want one, don't snooze or you might lose. Well, that's it, so let's end it here. And until next time, keep your ear close to the ground and read a book. Adios.